Okay, hi everyone, my name's Rebecca, I'm a fish biologist and ichthyologist and also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of lower card catfishes, which are also known as plecos, whiptail catfishes, L numbers within the aquarium trade. So today I'm going to talk about a topic that's kind of related because I think it's kind of one we don't really think about much and that's related to parasites and pathogens and their potential benefits and of course there's a lot of science into this topic and it's kind of got a few debates and things like that and you'll see all sorts of additions um, to your fish diets in the terms of like probiotics and stuff like that. So I'm going to discuss it kind of maybe a bit more briefly than some of the details that I could do in like a written article or something. So when are parasites beneficial? Well firstly parasites I'm using in the broad context so when I mean parasites and pathogens I don't just mean ectoparasites, endoparasites when it comes to sort of animals. I'm also referring somewhat to I guess uh, bacteria and even potentially viruses. So I'm using it more in the broad context. So when we think of animals, we think a lot of them as independent organisms. We don't think about them having sort of other relationships internally or on their skin, on their tissues with other organisms. But in fact, a lot of animals, plants, whatever, life has something known as a parasitic load or has pathogens, it has interactions with um, bacteria and other microbes. So generally we're thinking about here the parasitic load and that's generally used to refer to maybe worms, lice, stuff like that that most animals have on them. And this does relate to fishes, so many fishes will have some parasitic load when it comes particularly to like worms, whether it be nematodes most often, um, or platyhelminths, but also other parasites, maybe like lice, scarodactylids, uh, protozoa, so going more into um, ciliates, um, and other groups. So there are a whole host of different invertebrate and sort of going out um, into eukaryotic parasitic loads. There's also many bacteria that we present not just externally on the slime coat of the fish or the skin of the fish or the dermal plating of the fish but also internally within the fish's gut. So this makes it quite a wide topic because we're thinking about so many taxa that often many associate with disease actually having some sort of potential benefit and when thinking about this parasitic load also think about how many generally a low level would be normal but as a fish's health decreases its immune system is less likely to respond to uh, change or well, respond to let's say to respond to different pathogens and that means parasites too therefore their parasitic loads can increase and this can happen quite often after import or moving to a different tank if the temperature drops if uh, nitrates get too high if anything peaks then that causes physiological stress and often their immune system drops and therefore you get more of these pathogens and that's um, or the pathogens proliferating it's not more species but more individuals of the same uh, sort of pathogens and some are very good at taking advantage of this more than others so parasitic load is a little bit more complex than there's just a parasite and that's an issue and that's why you might see particularly it seems like white spot I think is always in most aquariums when the temperature drops then it tends to like a drastic drop can result in an outbreak but firstly you do have to have it there so not always but it can result in other sort of infections taking hold and it happens with people all the time when you're stressed you're more likely to get an infection so, but the potential benefits here, we have some very complicated species-species interactions. And it doesn't have, like we constantly think about species-species interactions in closely related ones, but then we're dealing here with whether it be protozoa, whether it be um, bacteria, they're all interacting together and feeding on maybe different things, maybe feeding on the same things, competing for space dealing with each other because they're going through their own chemical warfare almost with different compounds um, that some 
different protozoa parasites will be fending off others or maybe even promoting others so there's this whole like complicated interactions and that's why maintaining the actual health of the fish is important because you're going to most likely have maybe a more diverse ecosystem of parasites and pathogens pathogens not always i mean uh, microbes that cause disease but also ones which are just there or in higher levels they might cause disease so it's a really actually quite complicated concept but not just are they going through this warfare so maintaining healthy like ideally higher levels of those that are less likely to cause disease or not going to cause disease is always going to be beneficial but also other potential benefits whether it be with um, microbes in the gut regarding digestion they have a very important purpose there um, but also just in general there's all sorts of like physiological ones some people think it could um, there's also an autoimmunity connection with different pathogens the digestive ones are probably the most interesting because generally after treatment they have the biggest effect probably if you're importing a fish if you're um, acclimatizing a fish and their effect what a fish can digest and how well they can digest and there's so much more interaction when it comes to that gut body axis a uh, gut brain sort of axis that might affect a fish more than we think so this also comes into treating because if you're treating you're you are removing a lot of certain groups of microbes certain groups of parasites and it, it will be indiscriminate within those groups so if it's the beneficial and the harmful ones so you might actually almost create a void where those that are most adaptable but could actually be harmful might start to proliferate so it's quite a complicated thing and that's why you shouldn't indiscriminately treat ideally or preventatively treat instead you should target ideally what you think the pathogen is and this is where antibiotics shouldn't be used uh, like sweets almost so don't just treat whenever you see something just without even actually knowing what it is and don't use a broad spectrum ideally ideally target what the individual parasite you think is of protozoan because you will be damaging a lot more and it's better not to cross off loads of treatments and really affecting that gut um, system and there's also subtle things that will influence it anyway so I'm going to go a little bit more onto microbes now so microbes as I said are involved in digestion and that's not just bacteria we're also talking archaea here where do they come from? Um, so these organisms come from a variety of sources uh, so for example in discus fishes they actually get quite a bit of their gut biota a little bit like colostrum in mammals where they get it from um, the parents uh, slime coat as their or the mucus that they're producing to feed the um, juvenile larval um, baby discus but it's possible it also comes from fish waste now I think this is a potentially interesting one that if you're acclimatizing a fish if you're um, quarantining a fish quarantining it on its own or in a more sterile tank might not actually be beneficial beyond it maybe being a bit more well the sterility might make it less likely to feel comfortable feel more it will feel more stressed but it's more that these previous healthy fish have been in this tank or are with these fish and they're also got their healthy gut biota and their healthy feces in the tank so i think there's something in not maybe having those sort of savior fish that you do with discus but just to introduce those, um, the gut biota, and it can just be in the form of fish waste from other healthy, well acclimatised fish that have been there a long time. So there's probably other aspects of where these gut, my, uh, gut microbes are coming from, definitely in different sources of food, um, but I'll discuss pro and prebiotics a bit in a bit. But what are the benefits? So different microbes, um, as in different species and different strains, actually affect how well you can digest different foods or how well the fishes can digest different foods. 
and therefore it's also affected by what foods they're digesting. So a help like um, I'm not, it's really difficult to sort of word it, but where the a more natural diet will harbour probably the most, or most natural to the species will harbour the most diversity of microbes most likely, and the ones which are less likely to cause health issues in the long run. And it's going to make digestion just a lot easier on them, so they're going to be able to digest more and of the right nutrients for them, rather than nutrients that might cause potentially um, he um, health issues to certain organs um, or just producing certain compounds that might not be beneficial. So other than that, it's mostly focusing on that digestion, that health, healthy sort of diet uh, where it's getting a fish feeding, getting a fish digesting as much as it can and being less likely to be prone to anything like bloat or starvation or even just being unable to properly digest anything leading to starvation which is probably more common than we think. So that leads to pre pro and prebiotics which prebiotics I'm totally behind so in fishes it would be mostly feeding something that is similar to a wild diet either through structure so or nutrition the nutrition is very similar or it would be through most closely related and it's really difficult to make judgment call on both of those. So this prebiotics actually um, are about harbouring, promoting the most natural, the most diverse, the most healthy gut biome possible. So certain strains and certain um, species of different bacteria, of different archaea. So this is about more culturing, it's more long term and it's about what you're feeding the fish and it's going to have other benefits too. Uh, like, yeah, so it's really difficult to actually judge what is a prebiotic because it's going to be here very dependent on the different species and what they're digesting compared to what we're using ourselves. Whereas probiotic is actually about introducing bacteria. So traditionally in fish foods you might see lactobacillus used. And I'm a bit conflicted on this. So it has been mentioned before that generally probiotics or bacteria introduced to sort of introduced to the gut tend to have to be specific to species. So this is all specific to certain groups of fishes. So this is why lactobacillus I'm not sure about and why I kind of prefer maybe thinking about in terms of having healthy fish around that will have their healthy gut biota and having healthy faeces basically. So it's um, so like it will have the more specific targeted species anyway. But probiotics lactobacillus is more like used in like humans and stuff like that and there's some benefits discussed. Um, and other probiotics you don't really see in fishes. I am curious about using stuff like miso. I guess rice um, harbours quite a few different, um, pro as well has probiotic properties. Yogurt, stuff like that, but we don't really use them in fish foods. Um, and whether you can actually get them into fish foods other than gel diets will be a bit more tricky. So generally I think that's almost it about looking at parasites and uh, pathogens in more of a positive and neutral way rather than just targeting them and getting rid of them. Of course we should always think about disease and fish health and fish biology a little bit more well, like with the pros and the cons, not always just thinking that all of these are beneficial and don't treat at all because sometimes you do need to treat, sometimes you don't and it really depends what. And thinking about not just like targeting the treatments but also whether these uh, pathogens are going to get immunity or resistance and judging what is the right call whether the fish does need treating or doesn't need treating and it'd be great if we had more fish pathologists in the hobby but right now it's a little 
like a little bit tricky. I do see a lot more personally, more ectoparasites because they're a lot more obvious and they're kind of a little bit more interesting in a way to me. Um, but a lot of them aren't the best understood and there's probably a lot of misdiagnosis when it comes to different pathogens, especially when it comparing to scientific literature and I've really noticed that with epistylus versus white spot. Um, versus velvet, versus tapeworm cyst, versus all of that. Anyway, I'm going to end this video here. If you like my videos, please comment, like and subscribe. And goodbye.